Donald Trump once again shows his dominance of the Republican Party. He gives his first speech since leaving office at a high-profile conservative gathering. But where does that leave the Republican Party? And will he make a comeback in 2024? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. The Conservative Political Action Conference is usually an indicator of where the U.S. Republican Party is headed. But at this year's gathering in Florida, there was only one man who stole the spotlight, former President Donald Trump. In his first major speech since leaving the White House, he criticized President Joe Biden and hinted at a possible run in four years. Those who've spoken against him in the past were largely absent from the stage. For many, his appearance on Sunday is an indication of just how much influence he still has within the Republican Party. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. But first, this report from John Hendren in Orlando. The former president told his most fervent followers the Trump era is alive, well and ongoing. We began it together four years ago, and it is far from being over. We just started. The news that the 45th president would remain on the national stage, the stage he stood on was crafted in his honor in the shape of the number 45, was well received by this conservative crowd. That includes the head of the Proud Boys, who calls establishment Republicans rhinos, Republicans in name only. And I got a Trump 2024! Trump 2024! Trump 2024! Trump 2024! The energy's out here. There's nobody that's going to stop it. We're going to vote the rhinos out. The party doesn't listen to the people. The party's going to have a hard time. I want to see him running the party now. I don't want to wait till 24. But whether the party's 2024 presidential standard bearer will be named Trump, or which Trump, Donald, Don Jr., or Ivanka, he didn't say. Who would you like to see lead the party in 2024? Uh, he's already the leader. Isn't it obvious? Donald J. Trump. And what about the other Trumps, Ivanka, Don Jr.? I hope they run for 28. In his first public address since he left the White House, rejected by voters, Trump eased the minds of many Republicans with a call to unify the party across the bitter divide he helped create. The Republican Party is united. The only division is between a handful of Washington, D.C. establishment, political hacks, and everybody else all over the country. I think we have tremendous unity. That call for unity behind Trump is a challenge to those Republicans who want to unite the party behind someone else in a post-Trump era. But the former president isn't releasing his vice-like grip on a clear majority of Republican voters. Every party, but now especially the Republican Party, has to look inside after January 6th and say, what have we become? What's our great history? And how do we go forward from here? And I'll tell you, reaching out to Donald Trump and more of the same, is not going to do that. As expected, in his kitchen sinker of a speech, Trump attacked his rivals, promised to defeat them, and repeated baseless claims that he won the past election. Actually, as you know, they just lost the White House. But uh, He also left the door wide open for another run knows? in 2024. Who knows? I may even decide to beat them for a third time, okay? Beat them for a third time. It was a welcome message for everyone in attendance, but for other conservative voters and politicians, it's a worrisome reminder of the widening rift in a bitterly divided Republican Party. John Hendren, Al Jazeera, Orlando, Florida. Let's bring our guests into the show now, then. We have joining us from Washington, D.C., Jack Kingston, a former Republican congressman for the state of Georgia and a former senior advisor to Donald Trump's presidential campaign. In New York, Lincoln Mitchell, author and political analyst focusing on American politics and democracy. He's affiliated with the Arnold A. Saltzman Institute for War and Peace Studies at Columbia University. And also in Washington, D.C., Jennifer Lim, co-founder of Republican Women for Progress. A warm welcome to you all. If I could start with Jack. So, Jack, has the CPAC conference, de conference demonstrated 
that anyone who had any ideas about the Republican Party perhaps cutting ties with Donald Trump after he leaves the White House, ridding itself of Trumpism, that is definitely not going to happen. He truly is the foreseeable future of the Trump of the uh, Republican Party. Well, I would say it put to rest that uh, the Republicans are not finished with Donald Trump, that Donald Trump will still remain as a vibrant part of the party. I do think there will be a struggle as to say who really is the head of the party. But I think that we could say for now it is Donald Trump. Um, he was the main event. And it wasn't just about C CPAC. C PAC was the venue, but really the world was watching, his critics were watching, Democrats were watching, Republicans were watching. He has that ability to get the camera, get the microphone, and the crowd does listen to him, like what he says or dislike what he says. He was the main event, not just at CPAC, but I'd say the main political event of the week. Interesting. Let's take that thought to Jennifer. Do you agree with that? I think Jack and I probably disagree on a lot of things, but I, I absolutely agree that it's clear that Trump is still the head of the Republican Party, for better or for worse. So we um, found common worse. ground in this show in the first uh, three minutes, I think. That's that's a first. Go, go on, uh, Jennifer. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, while CPAC, you know, I think it was a far cry from 1974 when Ronald Reagan addressed the crowd, um, you know, it was essentially a Trump rally. But I think it's really important, you know, while it's clear that Trump still has a hold on the Republican Party, there were some definite cracks starting to show. Only 68 percent of folks in attendance wanted to see Donald Trump run again. And I think that's relevant because this is a self-selected group of Trump supporters. So I think that really opens the door for somebody else to come in and, and be the leader of the Republican Party. All right. Lincoln, still a number of investigations, court cases going on. But is it safe to say at this point, look, if Donald Trump survived two impeachments and an attack on Capitol Hill incident, court cases are unlikely to impact his popularity within the Republican Party, at least. Well, within the Republican Party, that's right. The Republican Party, I think, is in an interesting situation here. Donald Trump, I agree, and this is going to disappoint your viewers, I agree with both of the other guests. This is still very much Donald Trump's party. He is still the most powerful force in the party. However, the Republican Party is in a bit of a corner here. If Donald Trump wants to be the nominee, it's pretty safe to say he will be the nominee. But he probably can't win a general election. He's the leader and very popular in a party that's getting smaller, that lost the last election, where he, you know, he won in 2016 by about as narrow a margin as possible in, in the few states, you know, the key states. So this is a tough situation for the Republican Party. Anybody who breaks with Trump is going to have a hard time, certainly a hard time running for higher office and may have a primary challenge. But if they kind of give in to Trump, Joe Biden or Kamala Harris or somebody else probably wins in 2024. This might be a good time to look at some polls. All right, Jack, I can see Jack is angling to get in. Let's let's listen in to a quick a comment from Jack before we go to those polls. Well, I, I want to say that, that Lincoln is correct in terms of everybody has to deal with Donald Trump, regardless of where you are. And if we're going to be the majority party, we have to have particularly northeastern swing, more liberal, more moderate Republicans. Otherwise, you can't get to the majority of 218 congressmen in the, in the House to have the majority. So um, it is tricky water. But I will say this, um, the Republican Party is not getting stronger. Uh, despite losing the White House, we had incredible gains in state legislative races and in U.S. Congress and in, in the Senate, except for in my home state of Georgia, which was a disaster. But, um, you know, we, we did not have a, a bad year politically. So there is something to say about the message of Donald Trump and the Republican principles of smaller government, less regulations, uh, pro-small business and so forth. Jack, you said that you didn't have a bad year. The Republican Party lost the election, though. It's a pretty bad year. Uh, you know what? We always um, you know, put the, the big prize, no question about it, it is the White House. And we lost that. But what I'm saying, it did not have the coattails of state representatives losing and state senators and U.S. House members. Right. Um, none of them. I mean, we had a great year in my home state of Georgia. Well, we lost the Senate races because they became involved in the presidential race. But we still had great 
a, a great uh, year in terms of the state house. Oh, so um, okay. it was a, it was a mixed bag at very I very think, worst, but I'd, I'd say it was not a disaster. All right, I can see Lincoln wants I think to disagree because I saw Jennifer was shaking her head in agreement, which is a bit of a surprise the direction we're going. So let me give a chance to Lincoln first, who might come with some disagreement. And then we'll come to you, Jennifer. Well, I, I may be the only person on this panel who's not been a Republican strategist, so I may have a different perspective on this. But, you know, it's a kind of an interesting situation, as the congressman pointed out. The Republicans had about as good a year as you can have while still losing both houses of Congress and the White House. And that's kind of an odd split the difference. They did very well at the state level. They lost the Senate by, about, by literally as narrow margin as possible. They picked up seats in the House of Representatives, but not enough seats, which nobody really thought they were going to do. And they lost the White House, but they weren't trounced there. This is a party that will remain competitive. The question for the Republican Party is, do they remain more competitive with a message that the congressman described as the kind of traditional Republican message, or, or are they more competitive with a message which is basically Donald Trump right or wrong, which is more or less the platform in 2024, uh, in 2020, pardon me. And then you have this other problem, which is that all of these Republican candidates, these politically sharp Republican candidates, tended to outperform Donald Trump. So that's a quandary. He tends to bring out voters, but he can't close the deal with those Northeastern voters who aren't always so liberal. We're not talking about, you know, for example, the Upper West Side of Manhattan. We're talking about suburbs and places like New York and places like Pennsylvania, where the Trump, uh, where the Trump presidency really hurt the Republican Party generally. So it's definitely a, a, a needle they have to thread. And I don't think it's going to be easy, but it's certainly doable. All right. And Jennifer, uh, go ahead and give us your thoughts on that. I could see you were smiling and nodding away. Um, I think it's really important, kind of, to build on bo uh, what both of our, uh, but what both of our, our guests have said is that, you know, if you're talking about Donald Trump as the future of the Republican Party, um, you know, I'll agree with Jack that this is the most exciting candidate the Republican Party has had in a while, and you know, he's able to turn out new Republican voters. Um, over 74 million people voted for him, but I think what we have to remember is. Not only is he exciting to you know some new Republican voters, but he also turned out Democrats in huge numbers. And even with the popularity of Donald Trump, he did lose the White House and he cost the Republicans the House and the Senate. So I think the problem is, you know, Donald Trump is going to be Donald Trump and he's going to stay exciting for a lot of people. But I don't think he can build that coalition that the Republican Party needs to actually you know win moving forward, whether that's the presidency, the House, or the Senate. That is a very important thought. We're going to pick up on that in a moment. But since we're talking about popularity in polls, reports suggest Donald Trump remains very popular among his voting base. Now, two weeks ago, a poll led by Suffolk University surveyed 1,000 Trump voters. Nearly six out of 10 said they would like him to run for president again in 2024. And if Trump formed a third party, though, nearly half would support it, while 27% would back the Republican Party. While nearly one in five said the party should be less loyal to Trump and more aligned with establishment Republicans. So clearly, Jack, there is still a bit of a challenge here. You said we had a good year because on the state level, you know, things didn't go too bad, even though it didn't go the way the Republican Party hoped when it comes to the, the White House and perhaps the, the, uh, the Congress. But how will Trump unite, as he vowed to do at the CPAC conference, the Republican Party. How is he going to do that when, you know, the polls show that there is still something of a division and a challenge? Well, in my own frank assessment, you can't talk about the election. You can't keep talking about you want it, you might win it, run and win it for a third time. That does not bring in swing voters. It certainly does, as Jennifer said, motivate Democrats to the polls. So you got to stop talking about that. Um, you've got to talk about what is your vision, and the president touched on it. And it's okay to contrast his vision with Joe Biden's vision, but you still have got to give that. You sort do of mean former president, right? We're talking about Donald Trump, former president, right? Just to, to clarify here. Yes, uh, I apologize. Well, just, just, just checking. Um, lost, in case we're, we're still in the election. Lost in uh, the moment. Okay, no worries. But, but I think. I think the best way to unify Republicans is to stop the circular firing squad. You, you've got to have the di philosophical diversity to, to hold the majority, and sometimes your moderate swing members for either party, they're going to be a pain in the neck. 
but you have to ha have them to get to the numerical majority that you need. And the way to do that is to focus on, well, what is your agenda, say, for families? We're going to reopen schools. We're going to give you health care choice for the economy. We're going to help small businesses. We're going to bust up the, the big tech monopolies. We're, we're going to go after for Main Street and not the Wall Street well, type Jack, did it sound approach. to you like that was the bulk of the former president's message at CPAC? You know, as, as you said um, earlier, that this was a kitchen sink. Everything in the kitchen sink was discussed, which is a very Donald Trump type speech where he talks about everything. Um, so I would right. say it was in there, but it wasn't the uh, primary message. And I All think right. the primary message should be ideas. All right. Let's let's look at what else was in the kitchen sink. And, and Lincoln, we saw the former president at the CPAC conference take a lot of aim at Republican senators who voted against him in the second impeachment. Does that say something about how, you know, if the Republican Party is becoming the Trump party, well, the agenda seems to be the vengeance agenda going forward. That seemed to be the bulk of, of Donald Trump's message, didn't it? Well, I mean, the congressman referred to the circular, the, circle, the circular firing squad. And when you are going, giving a speech at CPAC, naming the people who voted to convict uh, you on impeachment, that is, in fact, the circular firing squad in action. The Republican Party, the problem with what the congressman is saying is that he's right. That is a message on which a party can run. That is a message on which a party can win back support in the Northeast, in the Midwest, in those key suburban uh, areas. However, as long as Donald Trump is the head of the party, the message is Trump. The message is Trump's last week. Not a policy on small business that Republicans want to promote, but Trump's last week. Not an alternative health care policy that they may finally come up with after all these years, but Trump's last bizarre statement or last criminal case. And it is important to remember that Trump has been a, you know, a major figure in American culture for almost 40 years now. And in political world, you could say for a decade, but certainly since 2015, and he's never been popular. You know, I'm, I'm trying to think about in 1981, if you took a poll, how many Democrats wanted Jimmy Carter to run again, it'd probably be about 20 percent. A similar poll in 1993 about George H.W. Bush, you'd probably get slightly better numbers. People who lose, presidents who lose office don't run again for a reason. They've been rejected by the American people. And the problem for the Republican Party is, do they want to put someone at the head, not only who's been rejected at the American pe by the American people, but whose personality, his background, his behavior is a constant distraction from doing what they have to do to be competitive? Right now, the Republican right. Party is competitive because of, because of the way our legislature is set up and because of how some voters are more represented than others. If okay. we had, if this were a more of a small D democratic system, this wouldn't be particularly close. We'd be having a different conversation. All right. I think, Jennifer, it's fair to say you represent a, a wing of the Republican Party that wants the party to move in a, shall we say, slightly different direction than Donald Trumpism. When, when Lincoln there posed the question of that the Republican Party has to choose between basically traditional Republican values and what Donald Trump represents, where do you think what sort of decision do you think the Republican Party is going to make? Where will it go? Well, that, that's exactly it, is as long as Donald Trump is at the head of the party, there's no room to actually discuss ideas, um, you know, just broadly ideas in general. So um, what do people you know, like you do, Jennifer, then? Good, well, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, you know, I, I think the hard part is, you know, as, as long as we still have to deal with Donald Trump, um, you know, I think so many Republican leaders are worried about these Donald Trump voters and how they keep the voters, but kind of move towards, you know, what the Republican Party needs to be in the future to actually retain women and minorities and actually bring in, um, you know, young people to the party. You know, we have no Republican Party platform right now. They, they put out a page this year that was pretty much just Trump. And and so I, I think what happens is what has happened is Republicans have to keep losing, um, you know, like like they've lost the presidency, the House and the Senate right now. Um, and I think we're still in the throes of the Republican Party going back and forth between, you know, what their future is going to be. And I think by 2022, we'll have a clearer vision of what of what the Republican Party is inching towards. Um, but it's tough, right? Like if January 6th, and, and the insurrection that happened, if that didn't make more Republicans kind of 
you know, yearn for a new Republican Party. Um, I think it's going to be a slow, multi-generational process. Wow. Let me bring uh, Jack into this. Do you think a Republican Party dominated by Donald Trump can bring in some of those voters that you mentioned, the more moderate and liberal, some of the voters that Jennifer is referring to, women and minorities? Can you do that under a Donald Trump-dominated Republican leadership? You know, uh, one thing, uh, I think you could, can, one of the things that kind of surprised me last night is that Donald Trump did not go after Twitter and Facebook. And if I was him, particularly in front of that audience, I would have really driven that message. I was surprised that he did did not. Now, does that mean he's softening, he's, he's uh, maybe uh, reassessing his his view on the high tech um, or on the, those platforms, um, you know, uh, the point being is maybe he's stepping back and saying, OK, what is it that I could have done differently? Um, can I change that? And I think if a candidate and we do see it where candidates you, you have, think it's really introspection, uh, not the have, fact that at least some of them like Facebook are currently I think the decision to ban him is under review right now by their board. Do you think it's real introspection uh, he, and we'll see a Donald Trump who, who has changed and grown? I, I think the jury is going to be out for a while. But if we do see, as we have seen with other candidates who have had political comebacks, that they've changed, they realize, hey, look, I'm going to own what I did wrong, then I think that there's All hope. Right. But if it's going to be, you that, know, hey, I didn't do anything wrong, it's the, it's the world, that's not going to get the message across. We've got That's not going to win you the White House. Two shaking heads in disagreement. Let me go back. All right, go ahead, Lincoln. Well, I mean, in short, Donald Trump has been on this planet almost eight decades, and he's never changed, and he's never grown. And the notion that this will be the time that Donald Trump changed, this will be the time that Donald Trump evolved, that was a mistake that much of the mainstream punditry fell in, and it really wasn't enabling. So if I, Republican Party, the Donald Trump you see is what you get. This is who he okay. is. This is who... Always been. All right, Jennifer. We had a little bit of a head shake from you too. You want to add something to that sentiment? You know, <clears throat> since since 2016, when Donald Trump came down that elevator or that that escalator, he has never lied to us about who he is. Um, he is exactly the same as who he presented himself to be. And I, I think I, I think that's the problem, right? Is he never actually became a Republican? <laughs> he never actually. Um, you know, he, he's not going to evolve. He's, you know, developed his own Republican platform. And um, I, I think that's the problem is Republicans aren't learning from their mistakes. They're not moving forward. They're still the circular firing squad at CPAC. Um, and so that therein lies the problem. Is, is you Jennifer, can't... why does that seem to work at the state level, but not at the, the White House and, and Congress level? Well, I think what's really interesting, and I think this is another one of the cracks we're seeing, um, is that we had so many split ticket voters who, you know, don't want to see uh, Donald Trump as the head of the Republican Party, but they do want to support their, you know, local or state Republican. Um, I think that's why Republican women were so successful. And, you know, I, I, I think when you look at things like this, um, you know, that's kind of where you can move forward, right? right? There's clearly lots of support for the Republican Party still, but Republicans have an opening to get rid of Donald Trump. You know, replace him with anybody okay. else and you can actually move forward. All right, we've got, I think, 40 but, seconds left. I want to give it to Jack. Jack, can the Republican Party win the next presidential election with Donald Trump on the ticket? You know, I think if we stick with the principles that brought us the lowest unemployment rates and for African Americans, for women, for Hispanic, for workers all across America, that brought us uh, record numbers in the stock market, that created all kinds of jobs, and contrast that with a self-imposed border crisis that Joe Biden has well underway even before he was sworn in. If we look, talk about the schools being closed down and reopening, um, saying that California kids can go one hour a week, if our right. energy prices, I've seen gas prices go up 50 cents a gallon at the pump now. Right. If we talk about that, and that's one of the bookends of, of politics is the contrast between here's what I can do, here's what I've done, 
and here's what my opponent is doing. And in this last election, he could not really talk about Joe Biden's record. Um, but now the Democrats the next one will, he have will to be defend able to. everything Joe right. Biden does. All right. I know we can go on talking about this, but I'm afraid we are out of time. So let's thank our guests, Jack Kingston, Lincoln Mitchell, and Jennifer Lim. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the entire team here, for now, it's goodbye.